Thank you so much, Christina. It's awesome to be back here live from Built. And I have one of my best friends in the entire world, Miguel De Acasa here. Miguel, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Oh, oh. thanks for having me, James. Absolutely. I feel as if we were just literally on stage together. <laughs> we, we were. We were just, uh, what, 10 minutes ago? About 10 minutes ago, we had just oh. finished our amazing session where I got to talk all about my love for Android and your love for iOS. Yes. In fact, we, we were discussing the fact that in our relationships, um, that, that you made it work, right? That uh, you, uh, your, your household comes from very different backgrounds. You, you, have a, you have like an iPhone member of the family and an Android member of the family. And, and I said, I, I, no diversity in my place. It's all iPhones. All iPhones. Now, yes. it, we're, we're super diverse. So we have mm -hmm. uh, Mac, Windows machines, Android tablets. We have yes. Google Homes. We have iPhones, iPads. It's very diverse. And yes. what's unique about it, I was talking about, is that... Uh, uh, my fiance, she had this great analogy. Someone was, was asking her about this relationship mm -hmm. for, at her job. And she said, you know what I really like about it is that I can now test all of my apps or my websites that I'm developing on iPhone and Android. And they're having this She's like, only uh, developers in a relationship will talk about the testability of websites on their mobile yes. devices. So it's, it's yes. an advantage to be in a uh, very multi-device uh, household. And I think it's where like Xamarin came from, I guess. So uh, yeah, 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 that's exactly where it came from. Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah, it's important <laughs> that being take the photo. So okay, we talked a lot of, about a lot of different things in mm. our session. Yes. I think one of the most uh, interesting parts that came from it is someone just at the booth asked me. I said, "Can you show us how to build beautiful applications? Like, how do we do that? And how has that evolved over the years? Because beautiful in in applications seems to have evolved." about that. So I wanted to kind of pick your brain a little bit more on that and what we're doing in that space. Well, so uh, we've just recently introduced this visual uh, way of styling your application. And, uh, you know, for the past year, a lot of uh, people have told us that we probably should support a way for people to manually rendering uh, their user application. But I think that they've been approaching this a little bit from the coding perspective. I think that one of the lessons that we learned in the last, <laughs> you know, you really should have learned this on day one, but I, I guess it took us 10 years, is uh, you really got to start with the design. You yeah. really got to start with a good, uh, a good design team. Oh, thank you. Oh, look, David Platt is back there. Um, you got to start with the design and, and uh, uh, prototypes, even paper prototypes. Uh, you know, I, I, I worked with this uh, engineer many years, a designer, Anna Dirks, many years ago that did UI prototypes on paper, yeah. and she would bring in a piece of paper, and like, what do you do here? You click here, and then she would bring another piece of paper, and, and you, did, you did usability testing that way. And I think it's a lot cheaper to do it that way than, than the approach that you and I are probably more, uh, more uh, inclined to do, which is we start by brute forcing, putting things on the screen, yes. and then trying to make them look pretty. And, uh, and that is just a very tough path. I think it's a lot better to work with a designer, come up with a design, and then, and then, and then making the code do the magic to, to, to match the design is a lot simpler. So with Visual, we're, um, we're sort of embracing, uh, you know, for many years, we have the default user experience of the platform. And with Visual, we're making it easy to style your application across the board with a particular uh, design system. So the one that we're shipping today is the Google Material one, which looks glorious. It's very nice. It's good, but, especially uh, as an Android user. Big that's fan. right, as a big Android user. But as a, as a Microsoft employee and a believer, <laughs> I, uh, uh, you know, we just announced yesterday the Fluent Design System, yep. and it c comes with a expression. I learned this uh, word too. It's called an expression. expression. So it comes with the Fabric expression, and we're going to be bringing the Fabric expression to uh, Xamarin Forms developers. So you'll, we'll make it very easy for developers to either go full native, full material, full fabric very easily. So that way you don't have to develop your own design system. You can take advantage of all the things that right. these, these companies have done. Or right. your own, I guess. Maybe. It, yes. I mean, I, I don't want to name names, but I, I just went to a conference a month ago in April, third week of April, San Francisco. Uh, no, and uh, <laughs> second week. And, second. Uh, and the conference had an app. And uh, it's an app taken out of, uh, I would say, 2010. Hmm. So it looked like an app that would be suitable for 2010. But they went out of their way to implement a series of idioms uh, that are just incredibly obnoxious. It was, a, it, was a, it was a very bizarre set of choices. And I think it's, it's the danger that you fall if you think that uh, 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 if you don't start with a good design to begin with. So there were gradients everywhere, gradients in one direction, in the other direction, in diagonal, in the other diagonal, uh, pop-ups with different gradients and different colors, no palettes, right? Um, so uh, I think that there's a lot to be said about consistency. And 
And I think that you should build applications with these design languages and these design systems. And only after you've built your first set of apps with this, you should graduate to style your own. Got it. Yeah. But I think that you're, you're starting the wrong place if you start with the idea that you're going to build something from the ground up uh, as your first app. Yeah, it's, it's hard to, like you said, to, to try to brute force everything. And if you don't spend a lot of time with the designer, you know, like yeah. I did, I spent a lot of time with Antonio, our designer at yeah. Xamarin. And, and even the designer may want something that's against the design system. Yeah, you get, a, get a couple of apps under your belt yeah. first. Yeah. So one of the other things we talked about, um, we only had on a slide, was sort of that we have the native, we brought all of .NET to iOS and Android yes. and Mac. And then also we bring uh, all of the native platform APIs. Now, one thing that I thought was really unique that we've talked about a little bit in demoed um, is the interpreter. So yes. the C Sharp interpreter. And maybe a lot of people don't even know what the interpreter is. So I thought this is a perfect time where we can get yes. me and you on stage to talk about the interpreter, a.k.a. you, because I don't well, really, I don't really yeah. understand anything about it. So. so what you folks don't know is that uh, James said, we worked on this presentation together, and James added this whole section on the interpreter. And what the interpreter allows you to do is to Essentially, iOS, as you might uh, as you might know, does not allow uh, additional code to be loaded, yeah. right? And you have to compile everything statically. So we built an interpreter, so you could do minor updates to your application with the op interpreter, and to solve other things like reflection emit and other things like that. And James put a whole section on the interpreter. And I said, James, you know what? This just does not <laughs> fit the story, yeah. the arc of the story. I Let's tried just to remove force them. it into the story, and it didn't work. All right, and. And the first question that I get as soon as the presentation is over is, uh, uh, is there any way that I could load some code after the fact? It's like, oh. <laughs> yes, you ship well, the, the app. Interpreter. You're in the, you're, you're, yeah. even in your enterprise app store, and you need to ship something. Yes, you need to ship a minor update. You need to ship that a new screen. You need to add an extension. So, um, so the interpreter, uh, so you know, it was a victory lap for James. Um, <laughs> I told you. See? Yes. Yeah. You were right. Um, so now we support assembly.load. So yeah. if you get a DLL from anywhere, you can load it and execute it uh, dynamically. Um, and people have done, you know, there's some people that are doing hot reload with this thing. Uh, there's people that are shipping updates uh, to their application this way. So it's, uh, you know, I'm very happy with the interpreter. And it seemed like I know that on the slide specifically, that was probably the most important part to me. Assembly yes. load, awesome. Yes. But system reflection emit. emit. Yes. For the first time, truly kind of ever on an iOS device. On an iOS device and any other system with static compilation. Yeah. Now we have the capability of doing the interpreter um, you know, across the board and generating code dynamically and executing it. Yeah, so it really completes the .NET story on, on iOS. Yeah, and, and as the .NET story grows, I think a lot of developers here are hearing about .NET 5. We even mm -hmm. spent yeah. some time to talk about it uh, in the world of mobile. Someone asked me, though, uh, well, how does that, you know, is, are my apps, I have to rewrite all my apps, I have to reduce something? I'm, I'm a little confused. So what, what is the, the story of .NET 5? Uh, yes, so there. first of all, I, I am a big believer of uh, we don't break uh, customer code. So as we go to .NET 5, what we're doing is we're switching the class library that Mono has maintained for many years, mm. right? So we had millions of lines of code in class library code that were, half of them were Microsoft already and half of them were homegrown from an open source effort. Yes. But we were separately maintaining another full code base of that. And with .NET 5, we have one implementation. We are converging those two. And, uh, and uh, the nice thing is that we are running all the tests right now. So we've had a very extensive test suite. And we don't have, you know, there's no deviation between those two. So as far as the perception from the user, it should be the same. Got but it. for us, the maintenance will be lower. Yeah. We're going to be able to write twice as much code because we don't have two teams maintaining two class libraries. Uh, we're just going to have one team, the one .NET team. So uh, really working. for developers, it's, it's less about really changes to your app. There's really no changes to your app. It's more about the, right. the underlying run, the runtime. Well, we'll support right? the runtimes, right? Yeah. Um, the, uh, so when you choose .NET 5, there, there, there are going to be two runtimes. The core seller runtime mm -hmm. that you know and love and the mono runtime. And they will both consume the same set of libraries. And we'll be able, you'll be able to switch it. We'll make a default available for you. Yeah. So if you say .NET run, it will choose a default for you. Like, like when I'm making a, a web yeah. app and I say .NET run, that's going to run on Kestrel, but yeah. I have the option of running on IIS. Yes, so, uh, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So you'll have a, so by default, it will use, uh, for example, web workloads. Mm. Most of the time, that's always going to be core CLR. Yeah. Right? If you're doing a microservice and you want a smaller footprint, maybe you'll use Mono VM. On watchOS, right, you know, tiny device, uh, we're going to put Mono. WebAssembly will use Mono. Um, 
you know, Android is an interesting piece because Android has gone from, uh, goes from very low-end $30 phones to fairly high-end pixel book machines, yeah. right? So it is likely that you will want to use a, uh, the Mono VM for mobile workloads, but you might want to use the RioJet uh, yeah, VM yeah. for running fuller, uh, more full-blown applications on things like a Chromebook, a high-end Chromebook. Yeah. Right. So there's a spectrum there, and we'll give you the options of choosing one versus another. And another part of Dynafi I thought was unique is, you know, in the world of Xamarin, we've always been able to take those iOS and Android libraries. Mm -hmm. I got this question right after, like, yeah. oh, with Dynafi Five, I can do this Objective C Swift thing. Can I do that? Oh, you could do that today with with Xamarin, right? But yes. how does this change that story for developers? Well, so so what happened? Uh, what happened was that Mono has grown. The Mono VM took .NET and kind of embraced and extended. Yeah. <laughs> And we added features that were necessary for mobile workloads, in particular, interop with Objective-C and interop with Java. And Core CLR kind of took it on its, uh, took its own path with things like assembly load context. Um, so there's a couple of differences in the VM, and we're essentially, at this point, making sure that there is no difference, right? Sure. That they both yeah. have the same support. So Core CLR is getting Java and Objective-C interop, and uh, uh, Mono is getting a few things from .NET Core put into right. it. But essentially, you really shouldn't you really shouldn't be able to tell the difference other than they'll have different performance and memory usage characteristics. Right. And you'll be able to switch between those two. Perfect. But I get to ask you literally anything right now for the next three and a half minutes. So the question I guess I really have mm -hmm. is what excites you, Miguel de Acaza, in the world of mobile development? Like what is the next? What is the excitement? What keeps you <sighs> ticking and, you know, and get excitement? I just literally didn't discuss this with you earlier. So now I have to oh, talk while you think about your answer. Um, you know. Well, I think... <laughs> Uh, I have this thing where uh, I think that I've made it a routine now that on Fridays I go to the App Store and the Google Play Store and I download apps. Okay. So I spend, a, you know, I spend like $40 of, of, uh, of things every Friday uh, because I'd like to look at uh, new user experiences, new games, things that people are playing with. And uh, I really like to look at uh, all the innovation that is coming out of this mobile app. So it's, uh, it's kind of a routine now that that's yeah. what I do. And, and uh, my phone is full of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, things. Um, but development-wise, I think, um, development-wise, I think that the most exciting thing to me right now is C-Sharp 8. Um, we've, uh, with C-Sharp 8, we're introducing this thing called nullable references. Yes. And we'll be able to annotate the code and say, hey, this thing, we know it's never going to be null, or this thing could be null. And this is going to eliminate a whole class of bugs that we as developers have been suffering for so many years. So this was actually a discussion that I sold to, uh, I was selling this hard to Matt Storgensen at Evolve in Atlanta. Yeah. So that must have been 2014. 20, 2014. That's correct, yeah. So, I was there. and Matt's like, well, it's too hard. It's like, no, but it's just a couple of hacks. It's just, we got to check in a few places. That's it. Now, it turns out he was right. But it turns out that he was right for me to push to the end, right? Because, yeah, uh, uh, yeah it took uh, years to build, but I think it's worth it. I think that eliminating that class of bugs is going to be fantastic. And the .NET team has do been doing a fantastic work of getting MS Core Lib fully annotated, right? So we're annotating for nullability everything in MS Core Lib, and we're taking it up the stack, right? So nice. we're going to eliminate a whole class of bugs across the spectrum everywhere, right? Nice. And th this is something that F-Sharp does but, uh, uh, for the F-Sharp data types, but this is going to benefit everybody in the ecosystem. Okay. So I would say that's it. That's User it. interfaces and C-sharp paid so are my thing. I got one minute left. Yes. So I guess as we progress, we see tons of advancement coming in oh. mobile and desktop and web. What about the console? What about the terminal? What do you have for us? Oh, uh, well, I've been working on a, on a platform, on a UI toolkit for uh, console <laughs> applications. I'm glad you asked this. Uh, I did a presentation called Retro.net. And uh, you know, I still spend most of my day in the console. And I still, to this day, I still use the mainnet commander which is a tool that I wrote in 1992, right? So I've been using this tool nonstop every day for uh, 18, 19 years. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so I wrote a UA toolkit for c -sharp developers to create console apps. Beautiful. And I guess this goes well with the new announcement <laughs> of WSL and Terminal. So, so I guess I'm, uh, I'm, on, I'm on the edge of new tech. <laughs> the edge of Terminal. Oh, well, awesome. Thank you, Miguel, so much Thank for, you very much, for uh, answering all the random questions. And thanks, thanks to everyone for, for here and everyone watching. Build Live. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back for more live from Build.